most people think a PhD is all about publishing papers and hard work and grit, and it's definitely about that. But actually, success in grad school, I found, comes from the lessons that nobody teaches you. And in this video, I am going to be talking about what I would do differently if I was starting a PhD in 2025 with the knowledge that I have right now. So the first thing I would do would be to learn best practices around generative AI and how it would make me efficient as a PhD student. So I started my PhD in 2009 and definitely that was pre-AI days, pre-generative AI days. And so I had to read the papers by myself. I had to organize my references by myself. If I was completely new to a topic, there was nothing to help me summarize, right? I'd have to go dig out a textbook, a paper. And yes, you will still have to do some of that. But one of the things I absolutely love about generative AI is the fact that now there's so many tools out there to help you do some of these tasks, right? There's so many tools to help you be more efficient. Not as though to like make you cheat the system. I remember, one video I made where somebody had commented about the use of AI and how they felt like they were cheating. Now, of course, there are an ethical ways to use AI and I don't recommend that. That's not what I am suggesting. I'm suggesting that those tasks, right, where that used to be done manually and they were painful and they were long, right? Like if you have to do a literature review of like 10 papers or 20 papers in order for you to come up with a research question or in order for you to understand sun as subject clearly that is is tiring to do that manually and maybe you still do some of that manually but perhaps you could use generative ai to save you some time doing that work by using something like perplexity or elicit to help you summarize some of those papers notebook lm is really good for this so you can upload uh documents for instance with notebook lm you can upload documents and it will give you a summary of the documents and it will tell you where it pulled the summary the sentences from right it can even help you create a podcast episode i haven't tried that but uh some people say it's pretty funny but i think that this would be a really good way for you to get a broad overview of what all those papers are saying before you dig into the ones that absolutely intrigue you or which look like a priority for you to pay attention to because one of the things i found when i was in graduate school was i'd read all these papers and i'd find that maybe one or two of them were most relevant to what i was doing why read all these 20 papers to find out which one is most relevant when you can use something like generative AI to help you shrink down some of that time, summarize these papers, find the ones that are most relevant to what you want to do so that you can focus on those, right? And comment below if you are you are already in grad school, you're starting grad school, maybe you're done with grad school, comment below where you are in this journey so I know. And listen, commenting on these videos does help the videos a lot. It tells YouTube that you enjoy these videos and that they should recommend them to other people. So please leave me a comment. Tell me where you are in your PhD journey. But we used to have to do something called journal club, right? And journal club was when you took a paper, if for those of you that may not know, took a paper um, and then in front of your colleagues, you guys would uh, basically dig into the paper. So you'd share the paper with your colleagues before the journal club, and then there would be a discussion, but you would be the facilitator essentially. And sometimes I was terrible at these journal clubs until later on in my PhD uh, journey. Um, I was terrible at them at the very beginning though. And I feel like if I had generative AI, I would use this tool to help me again, to give me a summary of the data, a summary of the paper, um, what the questions were, um, and help me be more prepared for something even like a journal club. So even for presentations, for your dissertation defense, for any kind of presentation you're going to do, I find that understanding generative AI and how it can help you even be a better presenter would have been game changing for me. And I would definitely learn best practices if I was studying grad school today. The second thing I would do would be to pay attention when I went to conferences, especially to the people in the vendor booths. 
So when I was a, a PhD student, I had the opportunity to attend conferences and also there were vendor events by companies, right? Non-academic companies. So uh, Thermo Fisher, Mel Tenney, all these biotech companies that came to our institution to, do, to put on vendor shows. And I wish I would have paid more attention to the people standing in the booths because those people could have been my link to those companies. Now, I do remember there was one time during my postdoc when I had just began, the wheels had just began to turn in my mind about what my one of my next career path, career you know journey to be, and I went to one of the booths and there was somebody there and she gave me her card and it said field application scientist and I'm like hey, um so what do you do in this role and she told me about it and she did tell me to keep in touch but I never did and I I kind of regret that because I, I had a very long job search process and maybe that would have saved me time. Time. But when you go to conferences, when you go to these vendor shows, please pay attention to people who are doing something different and strike up conversations with them. Look for them on LinkedIn. I wish I had done that, right? When I went to conferences, I just went there. I sat in the talks. I took notes. Uh, you know, I enjoyed the city we were in because I was new to that city, but didn't really think about my life after my PhD because you know, I was an international student. That's a whole other uh, conversation for another day. But I, I didn't see what I was going to be doing beyond my PhD besides a postdoc. So I thought it wasn't important for me to talk to these people. So if you're watching this video today in 2025, as I re I'm recording this in 2025, maybe you're watching this at a later date. Um, pay attention to those people, right? Anybody... Yes, it's nice to go to the to the academic talks and the plenary sessions and all of those academic things that happen at conferences, but pay attention to the people that are at the booths. Pay attention to the people who are working in industry. Pay attention to what they are doing. Network with them. Take their cards. Follow them on LinkedIn. Uh, connect with them on LinkedIn. You will learn a lot and it will give you a network that you can leverage later on in life. I also wish I had optimized my LinkedIn profile whilst I was in graduate school. Now, I don't think I would have been able to optimize it to the level that I have today, but I think that um, preparing your LinkedIn profile is one of the most underrated things anybody can do for their career. LinkedIn is not just an online resume, it's an opportunity for you to showcase dimensions of yourself that are not always captured in your resume right and so in your resume yeah we get to see your work experience and we get to see your education and we get to see some of your skills but with linkedin you can showcase some of those skills it's one thing to say that you can do something it's a whole other thing to showcase it and so through my linkedin profile i've showcased that i can speak i've showcased that i can write i showcase that i can i can write social media content that gets attention and believe it or not even though that's not related to my day job right it has brought me other opportunities outside of my day job right and so use LinkedIn and I even see one of the things I'm so excited about now is the use of social media I see PhD students MD students, all kinds of students using social media to just showcase their life as a student. And I think that there's so much power there, right? Because I didn't really have that when I was going through school. And now I'm not saying become an influencer if you don't want to. Don't, don't do it if you don't want to. But at least for LinkedIn, right? At least, the very least, if you don't want to have Instagram, Facebook, all these other apps, that's fine. But at least Facebook. <laughs> I aged myself with that Facebook, didn't I? Maybe TikTok is the one you kids are playing with these days, right? Anyways, moving on. Um, but if you do not use any um, of these other apps or other social media platforms, at least optimize your LinkedIn profile. And when I say optimize your LinkedIn profile, you can you can say state that you are a PhD candidate at so-and-so university. You can list the different skills that you have. You have various places within your LinkedIn profile where you can add skills. And if you want a video on that, I'm going to leave one up here that you can check out and it will help you. See, one of the things is that we are in a, we are in a tough job market right now. However, recruiters are still recruiting for jobs. They still are looking for people, right? And sometimes they're looking for people just like you, but they're not gonna find you if you are hiding under a rock. 
LinkedIn can be such a powerful way for people to find you rather than for you to go find people. It's been true in my life and I'm always going to encourage people to get on LinkedIn. Even if you don't post anything, if you, even if you don't share anything, it's just a really good way for you to curate your work and let people see other dimensions of you that are just amazing and would be a good fit for the project that they're working on or for a specific role. Now, LinkedIn is great and all, and you should definitely use it, and I highly recommend it, but another thing I would do would be to start a personal website and curate all of my work there. So the thing about external websites like LinkedIn is that if it glitches today or if LinkedIn just decides that they'll shut down today, well, everything goes down with them. But with a personal website, you control that. Um, now, there are several services out there that you can use to create a personal website. And unlike, you know, back in the day when building a website was a whole project, there are now places where you can go and with a few clicks of a button, you can have a website and maybe sometimes you don't even have to pay for it just yet. Wix, Blogspot, WordPress, all of these will give you an opportunity to have free websites. And later on, you can buy your own domain name like genontra.com. I have a personal website like that um, and, and then have that. But if you don't have money to spend right now, you don't have to. But what I would do would be to create this personal website and this would be the place where I would put my resume, where I put my, my publications, where I would put pictures from my conferences. I'd create everything here, not necessarily for people to visit, but Recently, let me tell you this. Recently, I was applying for an opportunity and one of the places that you could fill out was a place for a personal website. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it seems like such a, a minimal thing, such a small thing, but I do think that a personal website can help you stand out right and so you can create this personal website you can blog on there if you want to you can put videos on there if you want to but the main reason i would create a personal website would be to curate my work and to curate my achievements right um i was just recording another video where i was talking about creating a wins folder creating a folder that allows you to curate and save and like a journal right where you journal some of your accomplishments or where you journal your accomplishments right and it can be a really, because a lot of us, we forget things. We forget the things we've done. I don't know about everybody else, but sometimes I forget what I've done. And it can be nice to go back and read what I've done and be like, oh yeah, this is amazing. So if I was starting a PhD today, I would definitely start a personal website, a personal professional website that curates the work that I'm currently doing. If you're liking this episode so far, make sure to hit the thumbs up button. And if you are on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating on this podcast. It does help with social proof and showing people that other people listen to this podcast. So if you listen to the podcast version of this, please leave us a rating on the podcast, especially on Apple Podcasts. Five is I would find time to exercise. This is something that I did not take seriously while I was in grad school and if I was starting a you know, graduate school today, knowing what I know now and knowing the benefits of exercise on your brain, on your creativity, on your mental well-being, I would have taken time to learn how to run. I always told myself I'm not a runner, but recently in my 40s, I started running and that was just a self-limiting belief. I had told myself, I am running. I, yes, I don't run a marathon yet. I don't run one mile in 10 minutes yet, but I am beginning to identify as a runner, right? And so, Maybe it's not running, maybe it's dancing, maybe it's um, it's something else. I really believe that going through grad school can be a grueling experience mentally, emotionally, psychologically, all the lees, right? And so it's important for you to make time for yourself where you take care of yourself. And I found, and I have found that exercise is one of the most powerful forms of self-care that you can give yourself that has benefits on so much more than just your physical health. And so if I was starting grad school today, I would make time for exercise. Let me know if this was helpful. Let me know which one resonated the most with you. And if you want another video to watch on succeeding in grad school, here is one for you.